but when the two men fired back, the assailants fled the area immediately. Word quickly spread throughout Koreatown that this method had worked. All right, y'all, welcome back to Covered Arms Channel. Okay, so today we're checking out a pretty interesting story, and that is the story of the rooftop Koreans during the Rodney King riots. So this happened in Los Angeles in like the early 1990s, before I was even born. So I will say in the gun world and kind of like gun, gun culture in general, the rooftop Koreans have a sort of like mystique to them. If you're not like familiar with the gun world or like anything like that, you might hear rooftop Koreans and be like, what does that even mean? Now, I wouldn't say I know more than the average person that does know what the rooftop Koreans is, but yeah, it was during the Rodney King riots and basically there was a lot of stuff getting destroyed and these business owners, these Korean business owners were going on their roofs, arming themselves to defend their businesses, which is, it's pretty cool, it's pretty American. It's like the American dream being able to have your own business and kind of be able to defend it. But this one should be good, it's from Popomedic and I guess Donut Operator is going to take a part in this video as well, so that should be pretty cool, but I'm very excited. Let's go ahead and check it out. Wednesday, April 29th, 1992. Chaos erupts in the streets of Los Angeles as tens of thousands of looters pillage the city. Tens and with emergency services unavailable, business owners were left to fend for themselves. Now, out of all the stories told of the infamous 1992 LA riots, none have scratched the surface between myth and legend like the story of a group of Korean immigrants <laughs> taking arms on rooftops. Hell yeah. This is that story. Dude. You know, the, the music, the clips are gonna be fantastic in this video. Popo Medic does it right. There's a few famous clips or like pictures you'll see associated with the rooftop Koreans. So we, we'll probably see some of those in here. But I'm more excited about some of the video clips because I haven't seen many besides like this one dude who's running with like a, a Glock or no, I think he has a Beretta and he's shooting it with one hand. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, those riots were bad. Again, this was before I was born, but I've seen some, some clips and pretty gnarly. You can imagine the cops definitely had their hands tied with this one. Interesting weapons, too. That's another thing you'll see with the rooftop Koreans legacy. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Donut here. The wait is over. I finally got around to making the roof Korean video after years, years of anticipation. Just hmm. kidding. Here's Popo Medic. <laughs> In April of 1992, four oh, yeah. LAPD officers <laughs> were tried following one of the most controversial excessive force incidents in American history. And yep. after the Rodney King verdict was read, all four officers were acquitted, resulting in immediate protest. Earlier, we had uh, quite a scene where protesters did storm the doors of Parker Center. The protest started out peaceful, but at approximately 4.15 p.m., a group of men approached the Payless Liquor in Delhi on Florence Avenue. The men walked oh. into the liquor store, grabbed whatever the fuck they wanted, and walked out with no intention of paying. Two of the men smashed okay. the liquor store's front door, and another man struck the store owner's son with a beer bottle, rendering him unconscious. What was that 911 about? was dialed, Why and him? two officers from the 77th Street Division of the LAPD responded, finding that the offenders had left upon arrival. And while hmm. making checks in the area for the offenders, a young man threw an object at their car. Approximately two That's dozen a big officers, object. commanded by LAPD Lieutenant Michael Mullen, arrived and arrested the teenager. But the teenager hmm. put up a fight and resisted arrest. Oh, okay. Wow, they teenager even had footage was a back then. Minor in the community, further agitating a mass crowd of people who witnessed the arrest. The police hmm. formed a perimeter around the arresting officers as the crowd grew more hostile, leading to further altercations and arrests. Okay, I didn't know what, like, I, I know these things, you know, can sort of escalate on their own with a few, like, unrelated instances, but for them to attack one business and then one person get arrested after the police were responding, and then that specific incident sort of escalating everything, it's kind of interesting. But of course, I didn't expect to be seeing like the video cameras and whatnot. Of course, nowadays there's, you know, everybody has a camera in their in their pocket. So everybody can sort of record everything. But to actually have a clip here where somebody has a video camera, it is pretty fascinating to sort of record everything as it's going down. Press. And fearing the situation could potentially escalate to a life-threatening situation, 
or the use of deadly force, Lieutenant Mullen hmm. ordered officers out of the area altogether. Damn. And by 6 hmm. p.m., the looting began on that oh, scale. Oh my god, okay. Well, the police were trying to do the right thing and de-escalate, and that went sour pretty quick, huh? The crowd began to turn physically violent, seriously injuring bystanders and other members within the crowd, absolutely polarizing the community and devastating why would, business owners. Why would you shoot a firefighter, though? It is really crappy. Like this is something that I'll never understand is why they go for the businesses. Like people spend their entire life or their life savings devoted to this business. And they, they're, you know, they're trying to help the community and trying to make the community thrive by having these businesses and supporting it and whatnot. And then people just take their anger and just focus it on all the wrong things. And now they're ruining what these people worked, you know, potentially their entire lives for. It's just, I don't know. It, kind of just blows my mind but it is cool and i i do think that in america people should at least have the right to defend their business especially if that's their livelihood and they're just trying to support the community that way hmm. damn the growing number bad. of rioters in the streets began attacking civilians throwing debris at cars pulling people from their vehicles, smashing shop windows, Why? and setting them on fire. The chaos had sent shock waves into get the living it. rooms of millions of Americans across the nation. As a Chinese immigrant by the name of Choi Si Choi and a trucker named Reginald Denny, who was delivering gravel for the construction of low-income housing, were both horrifically attacked during live coverage of the riots. Makes no sense. That's so annoying. At approximately 7.15 p.m., as reports of vandalism, looting, and physical attacks continued to come in, Lieutenant Mullen elected to take the information but not respond. Mullen was later relieved hmm. by a captain, ordering officers only to assess the Florence and Normandy area. And at 12.15 a.m., Mayor Bradley signed an order for a dusk to dawn curfew, as well as declaring a state of emergency for the city. Yeah, yeah that was stations. quick. That was very quick and uh, probably pretty warranted judging by the destruction we're seeing in these clips here. And on the following day, by mid-morning, violence appeared widespread That's as crazy. extensive looting and arson was witnessed across Ooh. Los Angeles County. The rioting moved from South Central Los Angeles going north through Central Los Angeles, decimating the neighborhoods as far as Westlake to Fairfax before reaching Hollywood. The looting and fires Ooh. engulfed Hollywood Boulevard and simultaneously rioting moved west into neighboring independent cities of Compton, Carson, and Long Beach. You Jeez. might even remember Long Beach native Bradley Noel singing about it on Sublime's self-titled album. R.I.P. Bradley Noel, fucking legend. From Olympic Street All to right. 120 Was Street, not aware. made the forefront <laughs> of many small family-owned local businesses, primarily owned by first-generation Korean immigrants, Ooh. many of whom escaped from North Korea into South Korea before immigrating to the United States. That's pretty many badass. Many of whom were formerly voluntold soldiers who knew how to fight. And the True. fight came to Koreatown rather swiftly Ooh. as rioters moved up north from Florence and Normandy with a newfound thirst for looting. At 11 I mean, you got to think. I don't know how it was back in the day for defectors. I mean, I can't imagine it's ever been that easy to defect from North Korea to South Korea. But you're making a very big decision to do that. And you're taking a very big risk especially nowadays, but I'm sure, again, even back then, it was pretty risky. Now, with that being said, they're also moving from South Korea, which is, you know, obviously much better than North Korea, even back then, and then they're moving to the U.S., and, you know, they're trying to live that American dream. That's a whole nother risk in and of itself to, you know, completely pick up and move to another country to try and earn a living and, and again, go for that American dream. So when you have these looters and rioters coming to completely undermine that or potentially undermine that, they're going to take that very seriously, which... I think is what's so iconic is just the the sort of stress and anxiety that these individuals went through to get to the position they're at and them just doing what they can to defend that livelihood and that freedom and that way of living. 30 a.m., one employee of a local gun store, David Jew, was working behind the counter when the shop phone rang. Mm -hmm. It was a phone call from his employer, Richard Park, who owned another store a few doors down. There Richard he is. informed David, that he was at the nearby shop and in the middle of a gunfight. Hmm. David locked up the gun store, ran across the parking lot, armed with a Beretta. 
When he arrived, yes, he heard gunshots, here we go. at which yep. point looters from across the street made their way to the gunshot plaza and opened fire on Richard and David. But when Damn. the two men fired back, the assailants fled the area immediately. That Word quickly is spread iconic. throughout Koreatown that this method had worked, in not only protecting Richard's property, but his life. Korean business owners who caught word of this began to phone in a Los Angeles-based radio station called Radio Korea, pleading to the radio station's audience for an armed response to help protect their property. Everybody parked in a street and they took some everything, liquor, you know, hmm. beer. When you got here, you said people were still inside the store. What did you do? Still inside. I shot you know, eight times, everybody moved. A merchant guarding his That'll property. That'll do it. You got anybody out there or just a shot? Rick Romero out here. All of the merchants here. Look at that. You've not messed with that business. The guard or police or anybody else. You talked about guerrilla warfare, and it's right here, right on the premises here. Just about every one of the individuals Ooh. in this. Radio Korea quickly became dubbed Koreatown's makeshift command center, warning listeners of the whereabouts of incoming looters, and offered itself as a 911 system, allowing shop owners to call huh. out for help over the air after the realization sank in. There would be no response from police, fire, or EMS already Damn. stretched too thin, That's responding so to thousands of ongoing emergencies. Yeah, you can tell they're serious, man. We need a national guard in here. We have no police support whatsoever. People are driving by shooting at us, and we have to do something about it. A local resident by the name of Ina Cho and president of the Korean Veterans Association in 1992 was listening to the broadcast and decided to call in a little broadcast of his own, okay. requesting all Korean Marine Corps veterans to respond to the area. Oh, Soon after, nice. A group of around 15 Korean Marine Corps veterans arrived, equipped with Damn. rifles and rendezvoused with Cho. The I didn't know this. To a large electronics warehouse, Kim's TV, where Radio Korea was broadcasting that a mob of looters were attempting to break in. The warehouse had an iron door, which the mob was beating and ramming with a truck. When the mob Jesus. finally took down the door, Cho attempted to stop the looters who were sprinting inside when two vehicles with a combined occupation of 10 people got out of their cars and opened fire on Cho, hitting him one time. Damn. Richard Kim, whose parents owned the electronics store, armed himself with a semi-automatic rifle. As the warehouse was under fire, his mother suffered a gunshot wound while trying to shield his father. That's and so as more Koreans up. became injured, more and more Koreans took up arms, taking positions on rooftops for maximum tactical advantage. Oh, yeah. Not only did they have the high ground and could see everything from the roof, but parapets made for the perfect cover from incoming fire. And these This is like super trippy to see. Like you're seeing this, and then you have to remember this is LA of all places. Like you would not expect to see this nowadays, luckily, hopefully. But yeah, for it to go to this point where people are literally like taking up arms and taking up positions on top of rooftops to defend businesses, it's pretty trippy to see, especially when you have like literally vehicles full of people going out to assault, like pretty organized assaults is what it's sounding like. Firefights were televised. Sheesh. More uh, familiar with weaponry than I am. He says it looks to be a nine millimeter Uzi. Uzi. Where Korean shopkeepers Was could it? be seen okay. armed with M1 carbines, Ruger Mini 14s, <laughs> pump action shotguns, handguns, and Daewoo K1A1s. Like, look at this dude's loadout. He's got a red polo t shirt and That's a, a Daewoo K1A1. I mean, come on. One of the most iconic <laughs> photographs of Roof Koreans happened at a small grocery store called California Market. The, the owner fortified his store with 20 well-armed employees and volunteers, Damn, all of whom were 20. wearing white headbands. They were often shooting blanks or discharging warning shots into the air, which is hmm. dumb. You gotta, you gotta wonder where those went, you know? But their methods were <laughs> as looters scattered, True. fleeing the area as quickly as they could. Hmm. On May 3rd, after four days of exchanging gunfire with armed looters, the rooftop Koreans successfully forced every single Damn. wave of remaining... And again, that's four days of them defending these businesses. Of course, there's going to be like every every now and again, there's probably some sort of counterattack of, again, vehicles coming in and trying to hit a certain business or what have you. But four days to be defending, especially when there's like little to no police support, it's pretty freaking scary because, again, it could switch at any point if for whatever reason the rioters or the looters wanted to move to this area in force then you're gonna have some pretty intense firefights and yeah it's just again it's weird to think about because it's la mobs out of koreatown saving countless lives and livelihoods in which the hmm. korean american identity was born i like that and on that same day, Respect. over 1,100 Marines and 6,500 National Guard troops patrolled the streets of Los Angeles, putting Damn. an end 
to the chaos. I didn't know that either. Holy cow. If it wasn't for Damn. a few brave men who stood up against their opposers, Koreatown would have been unsalvageable. The nearly week-long rioting killed more than 60 people, injuring more than 2,300, and caused approximately $1 billion in damage, half of which Sheesh. was sustained by Korean-owned businesses. Korean Americans have come to refer to the 1992 uprising as Saigu, which translates to mm. April 29th, a day Koreans will never forget. That's really messed up. That's so annoying. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more of these videos in the works and you don't hmm. want to miss them. So make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you. Yeah, definitely go and subscribe. Now I got to say, when I was in South Korea, uh, April, I'm trying to think. I mean, I was definitely there for, for during April, but I don't recall them celebrating that. I'm not sure if that's like, of course, it's probably not a holiday. You would celebrate in the traditional sense. But I don't remember that becoming a topic of discussion. You know, there weren't like any protests or any activists speaking out about it. So I'm not sure if that's something they do in Korea. If you guys are from Korea or, you know, you are Korean or if you know Koreans that think about this or celebrate that, that Saigu or, you know, memorialize it, I guess is what I should say. Then let me know down in the comment section because when I was in South Korea, I didn't really notice that. But I'll be honest, I didn't know that was a day of remembrance for them. So I guess if I did know that ahead of time, I would have been able to identify the stuff a little bit more. But yeah, it's, it's really, really messed up, especially for Koreatown specifically to sustain that much damage. But you got to think, it, might, it would have been and could have been much, much worse if they didn't have the ability or just the willingness to actually go and defend their, their businesses. So I got to say it's super admirable and it's just something that's, again, in gun culture is sort of, uh, it has a very unique mystique to it and it's very, very understandable. I can really appreciate that mindset. And again, huge respect for those that were, you know, willing to, to go out there and defend those businesses. It wasn't even potentially their business. Like they were going out and defending other businesses and for them to actually like use the radio station as like a sort of chain of command or like a command center is pretty freaking interesting. Also pretty smart. I mean, Everybody was probably listening to the radio at that point, but for them to have like a certain station they could tune into and sort of battle track where all these looters and rioters are going, you can sort of beef up the, the support in different areas. So it's really fascinating. And again, it's just weird to think that people were doing that in the US and of course in LA of all places. But let me know what you guys think. If you guys have any other fascinating stories about the, the LA riots or specifically the rooftop Koreans, definitely throw them down below, especially if you have any personal experience or if you have like any family or friends that were sort of there experiencing that riot. Because it is, again, it's just, it's a really fascinating time period. There's a lot of stuff that happened before I was born and I kind of get a little bit of appreciation watching YouTube videos like this. But again, it is fascinating to hear what y'all have to say or what your family members have to say, having experienced it yourself. But let me know what you guys think. This was a fascinating video. I will put the original video down in the description so you guys can go and check it out. And of course, Popo Medic does some great stuff. So again, if you're watching Popo Medic, thank you for letting me react to your video. It was really, really dope. But that is it for this one. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hit the thumbs up, comment, all that good stuff. I will see y'all in the next one. Thank you.